Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 139, November 13th to November 19th, 1863. Last week, we spent a large amount of our time in West Virginia after putting a bow on operations in Virginia briefly. White Sulphur Springs, while fought in the aftermath of Gettysburg in August, is connected well to William Wing Averill's second raid into West Virginia that sort of culminated with the Battle of Droop Mountain. While certain objectives were accomplished, it should be pointed out that the crippling of the Southern Rail Line is the most important, and during these forays at least there is a failure to do so. This week, we are going to look into operations in East Tennessee, but before we do that, we need to head back to a small crossroads town in southern Pennsylvania. Of course, we should talk about our Patreon content, so the posting of this episode should see our most recent entry into that space, and it's going to be a picture slideshow of the Battle of Perryville, and that is a very picturesque battlefield, as I've mentioned, so if you want to take a look at that, see what it looks like, the modern-day battlefield, then there is a link to the Patreon in the show description, and those proceeds do go toward the general upkeep of the show. Now, we're just about to get into December, so we're going to have additional Patreon content as well. And I think for this one, we are going to do something a little bit different. Uh, we are going to have a movie review, but this one's going to be uh, a little off the wall, a little bit different than the others that we've done uh, since we're, especially since we're talking about the Gettysburg Address today and Abraham Lincoln then I think it's fitting that we should talk about Abraham Lincoln, uh, Vampire Hunter. And uh, I know it's a little silly, but uh, we feel like we should watch it. Uh, and then, of course, we'll probably do Lincoln at some point. You would have to do Lincoln, um, and it will be an interesting contrast. Uh, so if that sounds like something that would interest you or any of the other entries that we have in terms of movies or memoir reviews or slideshows, uh, then by all means, once again, there is a link in the show description. So, on November 19th, we have the dedication at the Soldier Cemetery in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, which is now the Gettysburg National Cemetery. It's been a while since we wandered through the fields of the small Pennsylvania town, but we return for the ceremonies involved with the cemetery. While Abraham Lincoln would be speaking, his remarks would be brief. This is perhaps surprising to hear for some of us because... It is his words, remember, and not those of the more lengthy speech from Edward Everett, a former senator and governor from Massachusetts, as well as Secretary of State for Millard Fillmore. Lincoln was not really feeling well, which could have added into his lack of lengthy address. But back then, people were more interested with lengthy speeches, and now we have TV, so that squashes that. Let's first start off with the Gettysburg Address from Abraham Lincoln, and these should be some familiar words for most of us. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation, or any nation so conceived and so dedicated, can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. The brave men living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, nor long remember, what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us here to be dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that 
from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. So there you go. Lincoln talks about the Declaration of Independence and effectively ties into the issue of abolition and slavery. Past, present, and future are all connected in his brief speech. Remember, though, that we had Everett as the primary speaker, and actually the first speaker. While he gives a lengthy history on the Battle of Gettysburg, and we will not read the entirety of his speech, I do want to include here the final words during the speech because I think they are interesting as well as a good way to close the door on Gettysburg after all this time. So here we go from Everett. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the power of the leaders of the rebellion to delude and inflame must cease. There is no bitterness on the part of the masses. The people of the South are not going to wage an internal war for the wretched pretexts by which this rebellion is sought to be justified. The bonds that unite us as one people, of substantial community of origin, language, belief, and law, the four great ties that hold the societies of men together, common nation and political interests, a common history, a common pride, and a glorious ancestry, a common interest in that this great heritage of blessing, the very geographical features of the country, the mighty rivers that cross the line of climate, and thus facilitate the interchange of our natural and industrial products, while the wonder-working arm of the engineer has leveled the mounted walls which separate the east and west, compelling your own Alleghenies, my Maryland and Pennsylvania friends, to open wide their everlasting doors to the chariot wheels of traffic and travel. These bonds of union are of perennial force and energy, while the causes of alienation are imaginary, fictitious, and transient. The heart of the people, north and south, is for the Union. Indications too plain to be mistaken announce the fact. Both in the east and the west of the states in rebellion, in North Carolina and Arkansas, the fatal charm at length is broken. At Raleigh and Little Rock, the dips of honest and brave men are unsealed, and an independent press is unlimbering its artillery. When its rifled cannon shall begin to roar, the host of treasonable sophistry, the mad delusions of the day, will fly like the rebel army through the passes of yonder mountain. The weary masses of the people are yearning to see the dear old flag again floating upon their capitals, and they sigh for the return of the peace, prosperity, and happiness which they enjoyed under a government whose power was felt only in its blessings. So just to take a quick pause here and talk a little bit about what uh, Everett is saying I think it is interesting how there is this common culture, common background that everyone is coming from, right? And it's always very hard throughout history to have a civil war that is successful where two sides that have a common culture are able to split. You really don't see that very often. And I think, too, it is also interesting when you read some of these memoirs and what these folks are actually talking about when it comes to the war and how they both evoke Washington and the revolution, and it is uh, very interesting how they're looking at it through different lenses. And then he's also talking about how there are individuals in the South, and we talk a little bit about North Carolina, a little bit about Arkansas, we talked about East Tennessee, how these are pockets now of pro-Union sentiment, and we're going to continue to see this as the war uh, continues, especially as the South is again, not doing so well. So that's another thing that he's talking about here. And now, friends, fellow citizens of Gettysburg and Pennsylvania, and you from remoter states, let me again, as we part, invoke your benediction on these honored graves. You feel, though the occasion is mournful, that it is good to be here. You feel that it was greatly auspicious for the cause of the country, that the men of the East and the men of the West the men of 19 sister states stood side by side on the perilous ridges of the battle. You now feel a new bond of union, that they shall lie side by side till a clarion, louder in that which marshaled them into combat, 
shall awake their slumbers. God bless the Union. It is dearer to us for the blood of brave men which has been shed in its defense. The spots on which they stood and fell, these pleasant heights, the fertile plain beneath them, the thriving village whose streets so lately rang with the strange din of war, the fields beyond the ridge where the noble Reynolds held the advancing foe at bay, and while he gave his own life, assured by his forethought and self-sacrifice the triumph of the two succeeding days, the little streams which wind through the hills, on whose banks in after times the wandering plowman will turn up, with the rude weapons of savage warfare, the fearful missiles of modern artillery, Seminary Ridge, the Peach Orchard, Cemetery, Culp, and Wolf Hill, Round Top, Little Round Top, humble names, henceforward dear and famous. No lapse of time, no distance of space shall cause you to be forgotten. The whole earth, said Pericles, as he stood over the remains of his fellow citizens who had fallen in the first year of the Peloponnesian War, the whole earth is the sepulchre of illustrious men. All time, he might have added, in the millennium of their glory. Surely I would do no injustice to the other noble achievements of the war, which have reflected such honor on both arms of the service, and have entitled the armies and the navy of the United States, their officers and men, to the warmest thanks and the richest rewards which a grateful people can pay. But they, I am sure, will join us in saying, as we bid farewell to the dust of these martyred heroes, that whomsoever throughout the civilized world the accounts of this great warfare are read. And down to the latest period of recorded time, in the glorious annals of our common country, there will be no bigger page than that which relates the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, one of the reasons why I just read a lengthy passage from the address of the keynote speaker is that Edward Everett becomes the first person to have researched the Battle of Gettysburg. He needs to do this in order to give a better speech outlining the events that happened there. I think it's a fitting close to this main chapter of Gettysburg in this podcast by reading from maybe the first history podcaster to talk about Little Round Top, the Wheatfield, Cemetery Hill, Culp's Hill, all the other places that we know today. I think it's very poetic, and I enjoyed getting to read at least a small part of the address. The other thing I do also want to point out is that, like, even in this very small picture of the speech, is that you can tell he's he's definitely giving a very nice address, and it's a lot, shall we say, more flamboyant than what Lincoln is saying. Lincoln kind of gives this a couple sentences, and then he's very much the orator uh, in this address here. So you can see why he was the keynote, and then Lincoln kind of gets up and just has a very brief address, especially after so lengthy an account. And if you go back and look at the account, it's it's very detailed in what happens during the battle, what had happened there. So obviously there's probably not really a whole lot to add either as well. So we need to cover at least the opening stages of the Knoxville campaign because they will affect our events next week when we shift back to Chattanooga. To do that, let's have a brief recap of what's been going on in this area. Remember that Lincoln wanted East Tennessee to come back in the protection of the Union. Northern troops would write about the poverty of the people they encounter there, which makes sense as they were not benefiting from the institution of slavery. Remember too that Burnside, having moved to the West, was gearing up for a potential campaign to take Knoxville. John Hunt Morgan had diverted some resources during his raid into Indiana, Ohio, but by September he was ready to go in concert with actions in the Army of the Cumberland. Buckner's Confederates would be shifting under Bragg's direction, so they would provide little in terms of resistance for Burnside and his army, who occupied the city without much incident. The Union troops would write about the turnout from the pro-Union population, probably a little different than the poverty-stricken individuals in the more rural areas. For the Confederates, part of the command of Samuel Jones was forced to surrender. Jones, if you recall from our episode last week, is now taking on the additional territory East Tennessee into his department. This would pull his forces away from Avril's raid, which culminated in White Sulphur Springs. So now we see how things have thus far been connected. There is always the question of what exactly to do with Burnside, though. Is he going to rumble toward the support of Rosecrans, 
Will the Confederates shift their focus to take him out and threaten the supply lines of the Army of the Cumberland? All things were on the table for September. But Chickamauga would change all that. Burnside would be ordered to send troops to Rosecrans, which would be hard considering that the Confederate forces had damaged the key rail bridges at Loudoun, Tennessee. Rosecrans would also inform Washington Burnside was no longer necessary with Grant and the two corps from the Army of the Potomac on the way. Burnside would entertain the idea of moving his army in a raid on the supply lines of the rebels, maybe capturing Atlanta, but he was going to be harassed by Confederates in his own area. Jones was able to gather some 6,000 men, and Carter Stevenson's parole division from Vicksburg would start to operate in the area. Frank Wolford's cavalry would be surprised by some of these men and supporting cavalry, losing some 400 captured. Holding on to Knoxville and improving the defense there seemed like a good call. James Longstreet would be dispatched to maybe deal with Burnside. On paper, this makes sense for several reasons. Besides that, Bragg wanted to get rid of him. If Longstreet was successful, that might force Grant to abandon his plans around Chattanooga. What did not make sense was that Longstreet's two divisions would not really be numerically equivalent to Burnside, who was bolstering his command with new recruits from East Tennessee. So we see this kind of flaw in Bragg's thinking how maybe he's so gung-ho to get rid of Longstreet because he's one of these people that spoke out against him, and we talked about that meeting with these other generals and how they all kind of call him out. Longstreet is in on that. He can't remove himself from this intrigue, and then maybe he, he might have been elevated to uh, Army Command if he had done that. Maybe not, right? There's not really a good uh, yay or nay on that. However, this is where Bragg's decision-making becomes sort of weird. Like, why didn't he give more support for Longstreet if that was really going to be the plan? Or if he really just wanted him to just go someplace else, you know, he's kind of sending him on this wild goose chase. Why didn't he keep Longstreet with him and maybe use a more of a token force to check Burnside and keep him in place? There's all these different options that are on the table, but they, in hindsight, is 2020, of course, they all seem to be better than what he actually does. So the logic is there. If Burnside is somehow forced to surrender, then that's going to be a problem for Grant. On November 4th, Longstreet would make preparations, but his men would be ill-supplied and not really supported by Bragg. There was little in terms of intel on Burnside or the region. In fact, reliable guys were at a premium. But Longstreet would develop a plan to move his men to the north side of the Tennessee River, with Wheeler's cavalry operating on the south side. Burnside would receive instructions from Grant, but he would resolve to hold Knoxville. One would probably see Rosecrans being relieved and then say, well, I might want to show a little resolve if we're removing generals. Charles Dana and James Wilson would be sent to meet with the Rhode Island general to hatch out a plan. Burnside would scheme about maybe meeting Longstreet and delaying him as long as possible. He received a golden opportunity near Lenore Station along the rail line close to Loudoun. Longstreet had Jenkins' division across the river, with McClaws on the opposite side. Burnside arrived to take direct command, and men from his own 9th Corps, occupying potential winter quarters near Lenore Station. A reconnaissance and force would see the two sides skirmish for a time, but nothing would really come of this fighting. Burnside decided that Longstreet needed to be pulled farther away from Bragg, and thus called off a potential strike. There had been a real opportunity, and the Federals had occupied high ground, but the Northerners would withdraw. It is kind of interesting how that sort of a reverse, shall we say, of Fredericksburg, right, maybe, uh, could have been in the works. Maybe not quite the same scenario, but Burnside wouldn't have had to have been as aggressive as he was attacking such a strong position. It probably would have been the Confederates on the other foot. In the meantime, Wheeler would victimize Sanders south of the Tennessee and actually get almost to Knoxville itself, pushing his enemy back into their works south of the river. Longstreet would recall him, though, before the city maybe could have been taken, although this certainly would have been a long shot. Burnside would move the division of Julius White of the 23rd Corps, as well as the 9th Corps, up the Lenore Road, away from the rebels on November 15th. 
we will get into the makeup of the Army for the Union in two weeks, but just note that Edward Ferrero is commanding the 1st Division of Potter's 9th Corps and will be the rear guard. He will have three brigades under Morrison, Christ, and Humphrey, supported by Chapin's Brigade of White's Division. Chapin's Brigade, it should be noted, and most of the 23rd Corps troops in general were not combat veterans, so they very well could have been out of place when faced with not only their opponents on the other side of the field, but also their 9th Corps comrades. Confederates would begin their pursuit on the 16th along two roads, converging at Campbell Station. It was not long before the advance elements of the rebels were nipping at the heels of the Yankees. Humphreys and his brigade of Michigan regiments would engage Bratton and his men as they approached, holding them at bay for a time. Burnside would decide to make a stand along Turkey Creek in an effort to try to stop the rebels. This line would be more favorable ground for artillery, which prompted a duel between the two sides. Alexander would note the inferior quality of the ammunition the Confederates fired. You remember there had been this assessment of the quality of artillery rounds prior to Pickett's charge, even. Longstreet deployed Jenkins to the front and gave instructions for McClaws to probe north. Humphrey's Mississippi Brigade would roll in that direction, but McClaws would do little else, a miscommunication with Jenkins leading him to believe that that division would be leading the action. Jenkins would try to make moves without McClaws later in the day. Vander Law and Ty Anderson would try to flank the Union line on their left. Not only were the Union troops aware, but they were prepared to pull back even before the attempt was made. Luckily or unluckily, depending on how you look at it, Evander Law would not advance his brigade in a position to fully flank the line, and they would try to link up with Anderson, even with the latter brigade being told to stand down. This would not bode well for Law, who, as you recall, was already in the doghouse and had a personal rivalry with Micah Jenkins. Union troops would pull back yet again and set up a defensive line. Another flanking attempt would come to nothing. Burnside being allowed to slip away back to Knoxville in the night. In mostly an artillery duel, punctuated by some skirmishing, Union troops would see some 300 total casualties, compared to around 200 on the side of the rebels. Campbell Station had been important because Burnside had been able to delay the advance of enemy long enough to get his infantry away, a legit worry being that Longstreet would defeat him in the open field. Longstreet, for his part, should have been able to eliminate and cut off Burnside's troops, and in so doing, probably would not have had to conduct a siege at Knoxville. While the infantry had been saved, Burnside would still need to get a little extra time to get the defenses ready. In fact, the situation in Knoxville itself required the pressing of civilians to help bolster the defense. Sanders and his cavalry would ride out to delay Longstreet further, skirmishing on the 17th. On the 18th, Sanders would again meet the enemy, holding a good position complete with breastworks. Additionally, some of his men were armed with Spencer repeating carbines, so it was not exactly that weak of a force. With Kershaw leading the way, the Confederates were run into trouble, even with adding artillery support. Sanders would do well in keeping the line from wavering, walking calmly towards the works to get his men to stay. But the closer-range artillery fire, combined with determined assaults from the Palmetto State Regiments, would eventually break the Union defense. William Sanders would be mortally wounded, reportedly by either a sharpshooter or while trying to rally his men yet again. Confederates would suffer around 174 casualties, compared to between 200 and 300 on the side of the Union. Sanders had done well in delaying the enemy long enough for defenses to be improved and troops dispositioned. But even with this delay, the way was open for the rebels. The siege of Knoxville was set to begin. With that, we will close out today. We had a very important rundown of the Gettysburg Address. Hopefully we have that placed in a little better context after today. We also had to start the campaign for Knoxville and fight the Battle of Campbell Station in the process. Next week we have a loaded episode. We will fight the battles to retake Chattanooga, launched by Grant. Additionally, we will talk about the Mine Run campaign, returning once again to Meade and Lee. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review, 
Posted in the description should be a link to the website as well as Patreon and Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Feedback is always welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening and have a great week.